of that. But this is actually an attack on the enemies of the Bible. And it's actually an attack on those that would, that would soil the name of Christ and try to make him out to be Bacchus, try to make him out to be the god of revelry and wine. It's actually a, a kind of a reverse attack by asking this question. It really makes them, in their mind, it, makes, it forces them to have to come to a conclusion and to think, well, do you really think that Jesus would do this? Is this really consistent with who Jesus is? And obviously you and I who know Christ and have been saved by him could never imagine Christ doing such a thing. I mean, you didn't have to teach me that when I got saved by the grace of God, like it was a no brainer. Like if you walked up to me and told me, okay, so Jesus turned water into wine. So that means he got everybody, he got everybody soused at the, at the, at the wedding of Canaan, right? Like you believe that, right? No, I mean, you, you would never be able to convince me. You still can't being saved from that lifestyle. There's no way you could convince me that Jesus would do that. Like there's no way in the world. You know, that you could, as a lost man, you couldn't convince me of that, that Jesus would do that. It just, it's so peculiar. Well, we know who Bacchus is. We talked about him a little bit. And we're, this isn't about Bacchus, so we're not doing some kind of a expose of him or anything. But it just, he was the unrestrained Roman god of wine and revelry, religious ecstasy, ecstasy and frenzied creativity. Basically, the god of perversion and alcohol and drunkenness, right? So, yep. That's all I can show is his head. Yes. Yes. Everything else would be. And that picture was actually just his body, his top without a shirt on. So it wasn't as bad as, you know, what the other ones. I wouldn't even dream of using any of those. But all I could show is his head. Now, when people hear about the, the, uh, story, the miracle of the wedding of Cana, the, the, what they do is the wedding there, what they do is for some reason in their minds, they think of this. I, this is the furthest thing from my mind when I think of that miracle, but this is what many of them think of. You know, they, they, they automatically think, well, this is what was going on. That's, it's just ridiculous. But I showed this illustration here because that's really how they view that. It's just, it's ridiculous. Or they, they view it kind of like this. Um, Israel, when, when Moses came down from the mountain and he saw the drunken orgy going on and the party going on there, that's kind of how they view for some reason the, the, the wedding of Cana. Because if you're saying that Jesus got them well drunk and well drunk in your opinion is on fermented wine, then this is what you're saying would be going on. Because nobody has a party like that where everybody's well drunk that this doesn't end up happening. Because that's just the nature of a party. Yeah, he is. Look at that. And that, that was made by probably uh, Gustav or one of those men that, that wrote the illustrations of the, the Bible. All right, so number one, I'm not the originator of these thoughts, and if I were, you probably wouldn't listen to them anyway. Uh, it, these come from the King James Bible, which is our final authority. I'm also grateful for a man, uh, the late Pastor Bruce Lackey, who gathered these 10 facts together. What we're going to do is look at the 10 reasons Jesus did not turn water into alcoholic wine. Now, this is important for a number of reasons. First of all, for you and I to understand who God is more clearly. And, and, and anything that you believe about the Bible has to be consistent with God's holy nature. If it's not consistent with who God is, anything that God does is always consistent with holiness. Everything flows from his holiness. Every other attribute of God always flows from his holiness. So you always start there because number one, God is holy. That's, people say God is love. Well, God's first attribute is holiness, always, because God is inherently holy. Every one of his attributes flows from that attribute, because the reason for that is, is because when you are holy, completely, inherently holy, nothing in you has to change. Nothing in you can change because you are perfection. Jesus Christ is holy. Therefore, he never had to change because he was holy. However, he made himself a man, and the, the human side of him in that sense, the human nature of him, right? His, his humanity grew, and he learned, and he suffered, and he went through those things. But the nature of God in him, always completely, 100% perfectly holy. Always. So that's important to understand in anything about God. Why? Because that always makes God right. Do you understand that? That always makes his word correct and right because God is holy. So what he says in his word and what he does is in his acts are always holy. That can, never be, that can never be questioned by God's people. 
We must always understand that the scriptures say, be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That, that's first and foremost, all right? Now, understand this. We do not question whether Jesus turned water into wine. The King James Bible plainly says that he did. So there's no, we're not questioning the miracle. We're, we're not at all. That's not what this is about. This isn't questioning it. It's undisputed because God's word in the English, the King James Bible, our authority for everything that we do, says that he plainly did. That's our authority. We believe what God says. That's the, that's, that is uh, our final authority. Our dispute is with misguided men, and it's concerning fermented wine versus the fruit of the vine, which is grape juice. That's our dispute with men, that men would say that Jesus Christ turned water into fermented wine. That's the problem, because we understand the implications of that. So, in your Bibles, John chapter 2, the Bible says this, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now, <laughs> this is interesting. For anyone to think that Jesus Christ would produce or to get a drunken party going or get the party going longer uh, by bringing his disciples to something, to teach them something that was not holy, that was not just and was not correct, would be wholly ignorant of the scriptures. And that's exactly what it is, in my opinion, um, from what I have seen from men when they come to that conclusion. And when they wanted wine... The mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Very clear, right? His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. By the way, that's a good tract for Roman Catholicism right there to give to them. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That was Mary's complete submission to the Savior, not as any mediator, not as any co-redemptress, but as someone who said, submit to Jesus Christ. No, it's not the real Mary of the Bible. It's, that's right, it's not, right. Their Mary is the, the, who they serve is exactly, or Diana or Queen of Heaven or any of the others that, is, that has nothing to do with, with Mary, because they got it, obviously modern day got it from Constantine. And, and that's where it came from, all right? So his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. Now, all these are going to be important as we go through this, because everything that's being said right here about how this affected the people around is going to, is going to indicate to you exactly what he did, the miracle in which he did it, okay? This beginning of, the mir of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Let's pray. Father, Lord, please help us and help us understand this great truth. And uh, Help us to, as we explain the scriptures and go through these things, Lord, that we may grow thereby, that men would know the holiness of God, that they would abstain from all appearance of evil, they would abstain from alcohol, they would abstain from drinking booze and drugs and, and the things that it leads to, Lord. Help us to be holy men after our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Whoops, something got messed up with this one. I don't know what it was, but what's that? Okay, okay. I don't know how this got messed up, but anyway. In Hebrews chapter 7, number one, the first reason, and you'll have to follow me along here with this. I'm not sure how this got this way, but in Hebrews 7, 26, we read that the Lord Jesus is holy, harmless, 
undefiled, and separate from sinners. So the first thing that I want you to notice is the holiness of Jesus Christ. This is the reason why God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, would never turn water into alcoholic wine because he is holy. He is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. No doubt the Savior being God in the flesh had an air of holiness about himself that could be seen by even the most casual observer. For instance, even the profane soldiers who were sent to arrest him gave as their reason for returning without him that never a man spake like this man. So they went to see Jesus, and when they saw him, they said they couldn't arrest him. Why? Because never a man spake like him. We've never met a man like him before. And no, they hadn't, because he is God. The words of Jesus were different. He no doubt had a very holy appearance, character, and speech. Why is this important? I want you to consider this illustration of why it's important. The word cider may mean an alcoholic beverage or plain apple juice. Suppose you and I lived in the, during the 1920s Prohibition days and were approached by two people offering us a drink of cider. I think you would consider their character, right? And what they would say to you. One of the persons we knew to be one of the holiest men in town, faithful to the house of God, separated from the world, diligent in prayers, always witnessing to others, and the other was known as a liquor dealer. If one offered us a drink of his very own cider, we would assume that the holy person was no more, what they had was no more than apple juice. But there would be no doubt about our opinion regarding the liquor dealer's cider. If some liquor dealer offered you cider and he said, hey, you know, you want some cider? Probably going to be hard. Probably going to be hard cider, right? That word is the same, isn't it? There's, you, you could have cider that's non-alcoholic and you could have cider that's alcoholic. If I knew a man to be a drinking man, I would question whether that man was handing me apple cider that was non-alcoholic, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, we know about Jesus, and the Bible says this, that uh, since the Lord Jesus was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, you and I can safely assume that he would not make that which is called in Scripture a mocker and a deceiver of man that causes untold misery. You and I know full well that Jesus wouldn't be that person. We know that by his nature and his character. So, let me give you an example. What about this Ford guy here? If he offered you, if he offered, if he, since I know that guy, it'd be apple cider, okay? But this guy right here, the, the, the bad bishop of St. Paul, the archbishop of St. Paul that was sent in to cover up the pedophile cases uh, by, the, by the Pope in, uh, in St. Paul, we know that this guy, if he offered you cider, you might be afraid, Brother Paul, he'd be chasing you around a fire, right? With that cider, right? There'd be something a little more fire in that cider. And this guy is James White. And if he offered you cider, you would definitely think he was offered you liquor, wouldn't you? Because look at that sweater alone. It's got to be a drinking man to wear a sweater like that. Anyway, but, uh, but that guy, we know full well that he doesn't believe in the authority of Scripture. We know full well that he's into booze and tattoos. So if that guy offered me some cider, I would think it's probably going to be hard cider. So I would consider the character, if I knew this man to not be a drinking man, although he does have a Ford shirt on and a fish in his hand, um, but... Uh, that, that, uh, that probably what he's going to offer me is going to be apple cider, right? That, there's a pretty safe indication of that. This guy, definitely his character. We know he drinks liquor, right? We know the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church. We know they drink liquor. We know they promote liquor drinking. You, we know that, that you see those men at restaurants in every place, and they are tipping it back, and they are drinking booze. And also, they get drunk uh, in their own parishes and everything else like that, and all the other scandalous things. And then James White, of course, he, he pr promotes booze and drinking. So, I, again, the, the character would be questioned, right? I would be wondering uh, about that. Uh, Jesus, there is no wonder. We know he was holy, harmless, undefiled, that he would never do that. Reason number two, Jesus would never contradict Scripture. Look at Matthew 5, 17. He said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or in one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus didn't come to destroy, right? He came to fulfill. 
He lived a perfect, holy, and sinless life. We know that Habakkuk 2.15 tells us this, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. That's what sinners do. That's what wicked men do. That's what drunks do. That's what alcoholics do. But Jesus is the living word, and he knew the volume of the book that was written of him. The whole Old Testament and the law and the prophets and everything was written concerning him. It described the holiness of God, that you and I can never attain the holiness of God outside of Jesus Christ, the one who came and lived perfect holiness, the one who is perfect holiness, right? That's what he did. So Jesus would not have disobeyed this scripture. He never contradicted himself. He never contradicted scripture at all. And he wouldn't have done it there either. Now, some men do object to using these, this verse. They say the sin was giving the neighbor drink to look upon their nakedness. But we answer, if you give your neighbor alcoholic drink, you are putting yourself in that very class of people. Because you're giving them liquor. If you're going to act like a devil, then you are a devil, right? If you're going to give them liquor, knowing what liquor does to someone, it leads to that. If you don't ever put liquor, a bottle of liquor to your neighbor, it'll never lead to that. So guess how I keep myself from never falling for that, children? I never put liquor to my mouth. I never uh, hang around people that put liquor to their mouth. I never associate with them. I stay clear of them. I may have to work around them in the world, and I may have to be around them, but I sure don't have to go to their booze-drinking parties. I can stay away from them. I sure don't need to go to dinner with them. I don't need to spend time with them. I need to distance myself from them. And then guess what? You never get drunk when you never take a drink. Did you know that? Boy, that's very simple, isn't it? If you never take a drink of it, you'll never get drunk. You'll never be deceived. You'll never be taken by it. If you never take a drink, that'll never happen to you. But guess what? Most women lose their purity from this right here. I'm not kidding you. I'm dead serious when I tell you that. Most women lose, and men, by the way, not just women. Men and women lose their purity. And the Bible has showed you one way to keep your purity. Don't drink liquor. Don't be around people that do. If you never touch it, if you never look upon it, it ain't going to affect you. That's right. But this is the basis of much sorrow in the world today. I can't tell you the countless number of abortions, the countless number of fornications, rape, um, promiscuity, and everything else that has come from that. There's no accidents that, accident that you have... Uh, places they call gentlemen's clubs, which are not gentlemen at all. They should be called pigs clubs. That's what they should be called, right? Because that's what they are. It should be called, that's somebody's daughter, you nasty pervert, that you're looking at. Amen. Right, whether it's on a screen or whether it's, whether it's in person, whether it's at a, at, at, at a club or whether it's on a pornography website or anything else like that, that's somebody's daughter. Amen. That's who it is. That's what it is. And alcohol is always mixed into those places, into those things. Drunkenness and drugs are always mixed into that. It's an always a, it's a surefire way to lose your purity. It's a surefire way to do it. First Thessalonians 5:22 says abstain from all appearance of evil. So Jesus would never do anything that gave the appearance of evil. Would he? He wouldn't even do anything that appeared to be evil. So then neither should you or I. And when it comes to alcohol, we know that Jesus wouldn't make it because he wouldn't contradict the Bible. He wouldn't have got men drunk and disobeyed all. By the way, Jesus never led anybody into a, into a situation that would, that would leave them open to sin against him, against God. So his life was not lived on the edge. His life was not lived in question, where you'd look at him and say, huh, I wonder if I can get away with doing that. You can't look at Christ's life and think that. You, you'll never be able to look at his life and think, man, I wonder if Jesus left any room open for this or that. No, he didn't. 
His life was completely holy, as yours should be. You and I should be careful not to do anything that would give the impression we would side with sinfulness, right? Reason three. You know, the priests were to abstain from wine and strong drink. Look at Leviticus chapter 10, verse 9 through 11. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When ye go into the tabernacle, the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, that, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord had spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. So you see, the priests were to be holy men. They were to be men of example. Well, Jesus is a priest. Better than that of the order of, of, of Levi, right? Hebrews 2.17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. If Christ would have made or drunk alcoholic wine, he would have been disqualified from being a faithful high priest. Listen, if you want to, be, if you want to make an excuse to sin, you can take the Bible and do it. I've seen men handle the word of God deceitfully, and they'll use it in a way so that they can get away with sin. I mean, a lot of the reform booze and tattoos movement right now, they're doing the same thing. You don't think that doesn't attract the world? You don't think people want to go to their church because they have a brewery inside of it and they're all drinking and they think they're tough guys because they put tattoos on and they're living like that and they think they're some kind of a new Geneva or something? When the truth be known, Calvin probably would have killed all of them. You really want to know the truth of it. And I ain't even exaggerating. If he wouldn't have, Zwingli would have. One over there to him, he would take care of you. They wouldn't have got away with any of that. Right? They don't even represent the people that they claim to represent. But what they do represent is this age, the wickedness of this age that we live in. Who would have thought that, that you would see mainstream Baptists and people supporting liquor drinking and alcohol and drugs and that, and that, and that lifestyle with the, war, the world, which leads into the transgenderism, the LGBTQ stuff, the abortion, and all those other major things that have taken place. Alcohol is a devilish menace to society. It just is. It destroys men's lives. It destroys families. And for any preacher to not be against that and to warn against that, why are you wasting your time pretending to pastor people? It's a waste of time. How do you tell the drunk to get right with God when you tell them to casually sip on the same things that is destruction to their souls? Just ludicrous and nonsense. Reason four. Strong drink was not for kings and princes. Proverbs 31 verse four. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Isn't that what happens? There, there you go. You got, you got bars and free liquor and everything else up there. You know what? I, man, I made a guy mad one time. He was in this church, and he left right after I said the few things. He didn't like it. I, I preached against alcohol. This is the first time I did this years ago. So like eight years ago. Then his wife stalked me for like years, and like was really, it was really weird. But, but, but anyway, his... He didn't like the fact that I said, well, those people up on Congress, they're a bunch of drunks. They're a bunch of drunks. That's exactly what they are. I said, they're a bunch of devil-possessed drunks, if you want to know the truth of it. That's what they... But, I mean, he got really angry at that. And he didn't like that because he was a casual drinker. So he didn't like that. He didn't like the fact that I preached against liquor. And... and uh, which drove him out because he wanted to sip his booze and he wanted me to be okay with it. Well, you don't have to worry about me being okay with it. You've got to be worried about God being okay with it. It ain't about me being okay with it. I'm nothing. I'm just a messenger of the Lord. The problem is God's not okay with it. And you bring judgment upon you. And, and by the way, you ain't going to kid somebody that got saved out of a life of hell. I drank the booze. I did the drugs. I snorted the coke. I did all those things. So you're trying to convince me what I got saved out of is okay to do in moderation? You got to be an idiot if you think you'll ever convince me of that. Yeah. 
I know what Jesus saved me from. I know what he delivered me from. And more than that. But it says here it's not for kings. Well, Jesus is a king. What does Isaiah 9, 6 say? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's a prince and a king. John 1, 49, Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Amen. Revelation 9, 16, and he hath on his vesture, on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is a king. Well, it says here, it's not for kings, Olamule. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor, nor for princes strong drink. It wasn't for Jesus. If he wasn't to drink it, he sure wasn't going to make it for people. Oh, you, you know, I won't drink it, but I'll make it for you so you can get drunk. This will be great. We'll sit on another. I, I just, it, yeah. Matthew 27, 11. Jesus stood before the governor. The governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus said, said unto him, Thou sayest. My king is not a drunk or a bartender. He's not a bartender. Uh, Zechariah 9, 9 says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout! O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the foal of an ass. That's Jesus in his triumphant, triumphant entry when he came into Jerusalem, right? That, that was his entry into Jerusalem. Thy king cometh unto thee. And yes, he is the king of Israel, and he is the king of Jerusalem, and he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And let me just tell you, like Ruckman calls it, that deadly piece of dirt over there, that deadly piece of dirt over there is going to be used again. It's being used now. It's going to drag all the world back there because there's a reason for it. Because the king's coming again, that's Amen. why. He is coming again. And he put his name there, and he's coming back there. So for all these people that try to say, God's done with that, and that's all over, and that's all finished, you're nuts. He said he owns it, his name is there, and he's coming back for it. It's his, and he will return. And his feet will step down there on that Mount of Olives. He will come back there bodily. He is coming again, amen? He is the king, and he won't be coming bringing some liquor with him either to get people soused. Reason number five. I like to make their argument sound so absolutely ridiculously stupid that they're ashamed of having it. I do. That they walk away and they're like, well, I didn't say he was Bacchus. Well, no, you didn't say it with the words, but you, you said it, you described him as Bacchus. You're describing him as the God of wine and revelry. If men were well drunk, and that's your excuse for getting well drunk in the way that you believe, which is intoxicating. By the way, you're not supposed to be uh, intoxicated with a phony spirit with the wine of Sodom. And you're certainly not supposed to be with wine. He said, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. But be filled with the spirit. Shouldn't you be more worried about being filled with the spirit than what you can get away with in this life? It's just so foreign to the understanding of someone that wants to walk with God that they would think in their mind, well, I wonder if I can get away with doing this. Yeah, it's legal. It's legal to do a lot of things. But we don't take, our, we don't take truth from the government. They don't know what that is. Remember, the same people that want to tell you what truth is and govern truth online are the same people that say a man can have a baby. Now, think about that for a second. These are going to be the ministers of truth? Right. These are the, by the way, these, they're witches is what they are. Just like they just signed the Respect for Marriage Act, which do, isn't even marriage. It's because they're witches. That's what they do. They, they call it Respect of Marriage Act. What does that mean? It's a sodomite marriage between between a man and a man, or a man and a monkey, or a man and whatever aardvark they want to marry, or anything else they want to marry, anteater, or anything else, a frog, whatever they want to marry. And I'm not kidding. You think I'm joking, and I'm not. 
they're going to marry full-blown beasts right in front of you. Yeah, robots and uh, yeah, everything you could imagine. They're going to they're going to call it marriage and we're going to look at them and say that's not marriage, you pervert. Cuz there's going to still be some people that believe the Bible and haven't fell for witchcraft, right? And we're just going to be like that ain't marriage, you pervert. You ain't married. I tell them that all the time and you're never going to be a man either. Those those transgenders, I tell them that, man, watch them blow. They're their head almost blows off their shoulders. That lady that was standing in front of Planned Parenthood, when I told her, you'll never be a man. No matter what you do, you'll never be a man. I'm a man, because I was born a man. You'll never be one. Ah, ah. Why do the heathen rage? She just raged at that. Right. Praise the Lord. Number five. Christ did not come to mock or deceive people. This is important. The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Therefore, Christ could not have made alcoholic wine because that's what wine does. It leads people to deception, to mockery. It leads people to hell, which we're going to get to. But it, it leads people to hell, but it, it, it deceives people. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. People are deceived by it. Do so you think Jesus, somebody tried to tell me, well, I think Jesus, what he was doing was he was pronouncing a judgment on Cana, Canaan. So, so he made this wine into alcohol and got them all drunk as a judgment against them. That's kind of weird because if you study Jesus' first coming, he said everywhere that he didn't come to condemn that the world through him might be saved. When, his, when, when he was rejected, when he was rejected by men, right, what did he say to his disciples when they looked and said, shall we now to call down fire from heaven, Lord? Let's get rid of all of them. Let's toast them, cook them. And he said, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. The Son of Man came not to destroy men's lives, but to save men's lives. Jesus' first coming wasn't about destroying men. It was about destroying the works of the devil. Amen? But it wasn't about destroying men's lives. He said he came to save men's lives. So he wasn't coming to give them a cocktail of perdition. He was coming to warn them to flee from the wrath to come. That's what he was warning them from. He was teaching them and he was patient with them. He wasn't delivering condemnation. That's when he comes back. But his first coming was about him appearing and dying for our sins and being buried and rising again from the dead. That's what it was about love. It was about the love that God had for the world that he gave his only begotten son. It was about love. That's why he came. He took the condemnation on himself. He didn't distribute it out to man. He said, for the son of man came not of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What does that mean? I took their place and I took condemnation for them. I was the propitiation for their sins. I was the substitute. He took the condemnation upon himself. That, so that argument and that theory that Jesus got them all drunk as a, as a sign of condemnation is ridiculous. So, so Mary came to him, his mother, and said, hey, Jesus, I need you to do me a favor. Why don't you get these guys soused for me? That sound good? It's just, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. It's just nonsense. It doesn't even make sense. Some man tried to make that argument with me, and, and I, I apologize because I was kind of harsh with him a little bit when he tried. But I said, listen, when you're going to impugn the nature of Christ, it's just not going to happen with me. I'm not going to let you do that. You're just not, you're not going to, you're not going to come on my page and impugn the, the, the nature of Christ, right? And belittle who Christ is and make him somebody that he's not. That's just not going to happen. Reason number six, Christ did not come to send people to hell. He didn't. Hell is an awful place. And it is a judgment upon sin. It is the just reward and judgment for our sin. The Bible says for the wages of sin, death. That's, you, we die because we are sinners. There's no medical reason that man should truly die besides sin. Sin kills. Sin is always killed. And sin will continue to kill until Jesus comes back and puts down death permanently, right? But sin will always kill. For it is appointed a man once to die, and after this, the judgment. 
Hell is the judgment. It is the just. Every person in this room and under the sound of my voice deserves hell. There isn't a man alive on this earth that does not deserve hell. We all do. It is the just reward for our sin. Sin that we love, sin that we commit, because we have a sinful nature and we love it. And no matter what it is, whether it's alcohol, whether it's fornication, whether it's pornography, whether it's, whether it's hate and anger, malice, wrath, whatever it is, whatever it is, it qualifies us for hell. Most of it stems from pride. And pride is what leads all men to hell. Our pride. Because then we get proud about ourselves. We get proud and everything stems from a corrupt nature of pride and arrogancy against God. And it leads to a devil's hell. Well, Jesus did not come to send people to hell, to the lake of fire, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Jesus didn't, he came that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. The Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. Jesus came to set the captives free. He came, he came to deliver men from their sins. His name means to, he will save his people from their sins. That's why he came. He came to save you from your sins. Is that a blessing? That's why Jesus came. You know, there's people that say, Jesus came to save me from hell. No, he came to save you from your sins. Hell is the deservance of your sins. That's the just reward for your sins. He came to save you from something even greater than hell, your sin. Because hell will not quench the flames of sin. It will not quench the dirtiness and the rottenness of sin. For all of eternity, sin will dwell in hell. It will always in the lake of fire. It will always end up in the lake of fire. And sinners will still be there, and they will never, that fire will never burn out that sin. That sin will dwell there for all of eternity. It will never go away. It will always be there. They will be stuck in their sinful nature in the lake of fire for all of eternity. That's why Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Because their sin is what puts them in hell. Their sin is what controls them. Their sin is what destroys them. And Jesus said he came to deliver them. He came to make, when the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. He makes us free that it no longer controls us. as only by repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus didn't come to send people to hell. But what does the Bible say? Whoops. What does the Bible say in Isaiah 5.11? Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. I used to know people, they would get up in the morning, or know of people, they would get up in the morning, they would have cases of beer, and they would just drink that beer all day long. The time, the up, sun up to sundown. By the way, I was no better when I was a lost man. As soon as I got up in the morning, I smoked weed. As soon as I got up in the morning, I did a wake and bake. As soon as I, the afternoon hit, I was doing it again. The evening hit, I was doing it again. Until I slept after my sixth meal from having the munchies, I kept, I, I, I smoked weed from sun up to sundown. I was no different, just as bad as they were, just as evil and rotten and wicked as they were, right? There isn't anything condoned about that dirty, rotten, filthy sin, but that's, that's what they do. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink that continue until night, till wine inflame them. How many drunks have you seen that this is really their life? It's all they live for. They're actually functioning alcoholics in that sense, right? They're functioning drunkards, um, to use the biblical term. I, we call it alcoholic and, and whatever. I mean, I know it's a modern vernacular, whatever. But the truth is they're drunkards. When you look at a man and he's on the street, you need to look at him and say, well, sir, you're an alcoholic. No, you need to look at him and say, the Bible calls you a drunkard. You are a drunkard. That affects them. They don't like being called that. Because that is so plain, isn't it? You're a drunkard. What you, and I've told him, I've looked right at him, you're a drunkard. That's exactly what you are. The Bible calls you a drunk. It calls you a drunkard. No drunkard shall inherit eternal life. 
The Bible says they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tavern and the pipe and wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Look what happens. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. That's now. Same thing. You can, you can apply that physically and spiritually, but that's a drunkard right there. Mm -hmm. Their families go to famishing too, don't they? Bottom don't have any money for food. They spend all their paychecks on liquor. Spend it all on drugs or methamphetamines, whatever. You can, it's, it's any of them. Alcohol is the easiest one in the sense that it's more readily available to any place, anywhere you want at any time. Delivered right to your door now. The governor, Tim Walls, got it delivered. So it's, it was, he signed his uh, emperor's proclamation uh, to deliver liquor during COVID. And all it was was to get people so drunk that they weren't paying attention to anything while they enslaved them and made them sit in cages. So they couldn't go live their life. But you can get soused. We'll get you drunk. You can sit there and get drunk. Now we want to make sure our restaurants stay open. Well, how'd they keep the restaurants open? The ones that sold liquor. They kept the liquor stores were open and you could walk into a liquor store and you could get liquor during COVID, but you couldn't go to other places. You were restricted from going other places. But the municipal liquor stores that are owned by the cities, they were, they were open for business. Right? That's just the truth, friend, right there. Why? Because that's the nature of the beast. Therefore, look what happens. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself. Off what? Strong drink. Wine that inflames them. The direct context to this, and it could be any sin, by the way, but the direct context to this is alcohol. It's drinking. Booze, it's strong drink. It inflames them. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp. And he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. The Bible says, No drunkard shall inherit eternal life. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hell awaits the drunkard and they that have pleasure in doing so, the Bible says. That's the lake of fire and hell is what awaits them. It awaits any of those sinners that give themselves over. So do you think Jesus would go ahead and get those folks drunk and lead them to hell? That's what you're saying if you believe that he made that into alcoholic wine, that they ferment, that Jesus is directly leading them to hell. The verse says that when the wine inflames them, right, that it would, that it, hell hath enlarged herself. How many people died and went to hell Sloppy, old, filthy drunks. So many. Exactly. If, they, if that was a drunken revelry, we'd have been preaching. If we were there at that, we'd have been preaching outside of those places. Just like we do now when we go to bars and outside of bars and we preach the Bible. Right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly, like that praise the loud event. That's right. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why Jesus sent him. You know what? I want you to think about this for a second and the hope that is in the scriptures. And such were some of you. Some of us were drunks. Some of us were drug addicts. Some of us were fornicators. Some of us were uh, living in all manner of evil and wickedness. Some of us have been, have, have, have been taken by those things. This is the hope that's in the gospel. Paul is saying that such as were some of you, 
Some of those were effeminate. They were sodomites and abusers of themselves. They were transgenders. They were all of those things out there in the world. And, and, and they lived all those things. And Paul says, and such were some of you. This is the hope of the gospel. This is the proof that Jesus Christ changes sinners and makes them new. So if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that has been stuck in any of these things and they're consuming them and destroy them, I've got good news for you. Jesus saves. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That there isn't a man that I can't preach to out there today that's a drunkard that I can't share the gospel with them and tell them that Jesus Christ can deliver you from your sins. Jesus Christ can save your soul and take, and take away the power of sin from your heart and life. And he can make you a new creature in Christ. He is well able to do that. Some of you have a testimony of being that way, of God delivering you from that. I have that testimony of God delivering me from a life of sin like that. But children, let me tell you something in this room. Better for you to have a testimony that you never touched it, that you never got near it, that you stayed clear of it, that you abstained from all appearance of evil, that you stayed far away from, that, from alcohol, and you stayed far away from drugs, and stayed far away from those things, that you can have a testimony that says that the Lord kept me from those things from those sins, and you know why? I will know that my testimony has been successful in your life if you keep from those things. And I'll know that Jesus, when he pulled me out of the muck and mire of that wicked life, that it had an impact on you, and he used that testimony for the glory of God to keep you from ever living that life. That you live for Jesus your entire life and you're never defiled by those things. That's why we do what we do. That's why we preach what we preach. Warning men everywhere and warning you as young people to stay clear from those things. Don't be tempted by the world. It has nothing to offer you but a cheap suit and a cheap slut. That's what it has to offer you. That's what the world offers you. It's a cheap imitation of what God wants to give you. And let me tell you young men something. And you young ladies, something right now, and you listen very closely. If you sell out for some cheap slut or some cheap suit in the world today, if you sell out, you will regret it the rest of your life because you've been warned not to do it. And you've been told that what you have is a blessing. Your purity is a blessing from God. Keep it. Keep it. Don't sell out. What God has for you is going to be so much greater than what this world can ever offer you. Don't take my word for it. Take his. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor that entered into the heart of man, what God hath prepared for them that love him. You cannot put a price on it. You cannot. Stay in the castle. Stay safe. Reason number seven. Christ did not come to be a stumbling block. <clears throat> I need some water, please. Brother Dave, can you grab me a little bit? Throat's getting dry here. What's that? Oh, I, I need that spray. The, I got it back there, but that spray that burns your, your, your throat out, that works good, though. Jessica, I was on the broadcast, and I was... I was yeah. Oh, no, I don't want any of that hot sauce. I want my guts right where they're at. Uh, I want my throat fixed, not my guts ruined. But Jessica, was, she said, you, you take a, a shot of that Dr. Scholz on your throat right there and, and you won't be coughing. Boy, she was right. I did. It worked. Lucius had to run it up for me. Reason number seven. Christ did not come to be a stumbling block. He didn't cause others. Now, the Bible says he was a rock of offense and a stone of stumbling to those that would not believe, right? But he wasn't to the, to the church, to the Lord Jesus Christ's church, to his body and to his disciples. He wouldn't have confused them or caused them to stumble. They stumbled at Jesus. The lost did and the Jews did because they did not want to accept him as Messiah. They didn't want their system to be destroyed. That's why they stumbled. 
they stumbled at the stumbling stone, but Jesus did not ever cause men to stumble into sin. Romans 14, 21. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. We should never do anything that would lead our children to stumble into sin. Amen? We should never do anything that would lead a weak brother into sin. We, our children should never see alcohol served in the Lord's Supper. They should never see that. Because it's not accurate, number one. And number two, it, it, could, it would lead them into sin. Well, if it's okay to have that alcohol, well, I can have it. Right? Have it. Yeah, exactly. Take the leaven out of the bread, leave it in the wine. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that sounds like there's a purpose for that, right? Maybe they just want to get drunk. So, in other words, you don't want to be these guys, right? I wonder if I wonder if that one father looked like this guy right here. That <laughs> guy. We met a few of these guys. I always call these guys Father O'Malley because it's just. Sorry. Or this guy. Right? That's Francis. Francis ain't messing around. Francis is like, look. He's like, look, I need a lot of that, that pagan blood in there. Yeah. Yeah. Jorge. Yep. Yep. By the way, if you wonder why the world today, the flavor of the world today is Marxism, because he's on the throne. He's the Jesuit, that Jesuit on the throne over there, his flavor is Marxism. That's what it is. That's why it's popular. That's why it's popular everywhere. There's a perp that, because of him, he's a Marxist. That's what he is, okay? No one knows their own limit of alcohol, by the way. No one. Once you start, some men can never stop. So if Jesus gave that to them, he would know that that would lead them into something that was wrong. Because it's a deceiver and a mocker, total abstinence is always the answer. That you can't, you couldn't control. Well, I think if I had a little bit here, you know, somebody, they can't handle it here, but I can handle it here. As soon as you enter it into your body, it changes your thought process. Christ would never teach for others to drink booze in moderation when he knew the hearts of all men. And the Apostle Paul taught us to abstain from all appearance of evil, which is exactly what Jesus lived his life, right? He was falsely accused by a number of different people. He was called a wine bibber, remember? Well, that's what these guys are calling him now. The Pharisees are still calling him that today. Think about that. Right? They're still calling them that today. Reason number eight. In order for it to be a miracle, the wine did not have to be alcoholic. It, why, why did it have to be for it to be a miracle? Now, they would have you believe that the wine had to be alcoholic in order for that to be a really wonderful miracle. Because it was good. That's right. We're going to get to that because it was good. So good only means drunk, liquor, fermented, right? So you've never like taken fresh juice and squeezed it and drank it. Like, man, that is good. Ever, right? Yes. Old. Yeah, like how old was it and everything else and, 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 Right. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How could it not be? He created all things. Right. Everything was pure without leaven, right? There is nothing in the miracle that requires it to be fermented wine. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It is just as much of a miracle to take water and turn it into fresh grape juice, maybe even more. Uh, furthermore, it's no different than Jesus' miracle of the loaves and the fishes. He didn't, I mean, he didn't turn it into old fishes and 
old stale nasty bread. I'm gonna make you some nasty bread. Some old stank fish. I'm gonna give you some old stank fish here. Here, eat this. Yeah, I mean he made it fresh. That's the miracle. If you were there and you had nothing and he took these six water pots and he told them what to do and they poured it out and you had fresh juice like that, wine, fruit of the vine, you'd be like, wow, this is great. Yes. Yes, it is. That's the point of it. That's the point of the miracle. That is the point of the miracle. That is one of the major points of it. And anyway, why should it be alcohol? Because sinful men with a fallen and corrupt heart want an excuse to get drunk? That's why. When you view the Bible from your own, from a sinful nature and experience from a sinful nature and not the nature of the teachings of Scripture, well, then you can think of a lot of things that are okay. Right? For instance, I'll give you an example of that. You can look at when, when uh, the two brothers of Dinah when their sister was taken advantage of by that guy and the two brothers of Dinah went in there and acted like a bunch of barbarians, lied to him, ripped him off, cheated him, and then killed everybody and stole all their stuff, you could think, well, I'd do that too if you did that to my sister. Well, you could think like that, but the scriptures give the answer. God said they were wrong for doing it. And Jacob said, you just lost your reward. You lost your inheritance for this because you did this. With cruelty, you did this to these men. Wasn't it that wasn't justified? He didn't justify that. He said it was wrong. Yeah, it was wrong what they did to his sister, but there was a better way to handle that. And they could have handled that the right way, and they didn't. They wanted, they had their own vengeance in mind. Plus, they wanted to rob them and, that, and kill them. That's what they did. So, you know, you know what I mean? You and I could take those things and we could try to twist the Bible around. We have to be careful. Vengeance is the Lord's. Right? And, and, and we have to be careful about that. John chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of the miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Well, what happened here? Something very special happened here. It says here that every man, they said every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And if well drunk, then that which is worse. Now, these are all going to kind of fit together, okay? But reason number nine, and I'll explain kind of all those verses that I just, I just read to you towards the last two. Uh, there's no, reason number nine is there's no glory in making drunk men drunker. How would that bring glory to God? How would that bring glory to Christ and draw men in? Well, if you want to do it like the world does, I guess you could, you could have a bar and you could get people drunk and you could have booze and tattoos like James White's crowd does and those guys do. And you, you could do that like the new reformed movement does and you could attract the world. And, you know, and I guess, do, do you really think Jesus did that? Well, I got a newsflash for you. If Jesus did that, they wouldn't have killed him. If that was his manner of ministry, he wouldn't have died. He would have loved him. He didn't love him. He hated him. Right. So you expect me to believe, I said, that Jesus got them well drunk on fermented wine and that manifested his glory? That encouraged his disciples to believe on him? Man, this guy's great. It doesn't, it, it's not even feasible to make sense. That being, that being the first miracle is the sin of getting men well drunk? That would be his first miracle? Here's some questions to consider about that. If they were well drunk on fermented wine, then how would they discern the difference in taste? Once you're soused, how do you know the difference in it? You don't. Remember, your reasoning and your understanding and all those things, once you're well drunk, you don't, you don't know. How would they discern the strength of the liquor if they were well drunk or intoxicated already? You wouldn't. That's why wine is a deceiver and strong drink is a mocker and a deceiver and strong drink is raging, right? That, because 
you can't discern after you're drunk, you're done. So if they were well drunk, how could they discern? You can't. There's no discernment with drunks. Haven't you seen them? Just, just be with them on the street. Be with the drunks on the street and have a convert. They have no discernment over anything. Yeah. They don't understand anything. Let alone the degree of liquor, the degree of alcohol, the degree or the taste of it. After one or two, you don't care what it tastes like. You just keep pounding them down till you're stupid. Doesn't take very long. Or dead, right. So if that's the case, then they wouldn't even have been able to discern any of those things. They wouldn't have known, wow, that is good. Well, let me tell you something. If you had a cup from heaven of, of juice versus what you had here on this earth, and God Almighty delivered it to you and put it in front of you and you drank it, you're like, whoa! Yeah. Remember, that's a picture of Christ's salvation. You come to him and he quenches your thirst. And there's no one greater than Jesus. And that's what that miracle was about. The answers are very simple. It was grape juice that was made. The taste was great because Jesus made it. And they could discern the taste because they were not drunk. It's simple. It, that is just plain simple. Reason 10. Making drunk men drunker will not encourage men to believe on Christ. This we know from experience, definitely. <laughs> uh, we, we know when we preach to drunks, them being drunk does not help them spiritually. Right? John 1.41. He first findeth his own brother. For instance, in John chapter 1, they already believed on Jesus. Remember what this miracle would do. It brought glory to God, and it made them believe even more. It increased their faith, right? So in John chapter 1, we see that they already believed he was the Messiah, right? He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. They found him. They said, This is Jesus. This is the Christ, the Son of the living God. John 1.41 shows us that they had already believed on him as Messiah. This miracle was a deepening of their faith and a proof that they had not been wrong. That they found the, they found the Messiah. Would making drunk people drunker inspire such faith? No. The opposite would be likely. They were not looking for a Messiah who would pass out free booze. Thus, because of the description of this miracle and its result, we cannot conclude otherwise than, this, than that this wine was non-alcoholic, says Bruce Lackey, which I agree with. Let me encourage you, if the devil is using alcohol to enslave you into sin, Jesus is able to deliver you from it. I, I believe that with everything in me, I believe it. I believe he delivered me from drugs and all kinds of other things, and he continues to deliver me from things and continues to teach me and show me and guide me all my life, right? That's what he does. Jesus is able to free you from sin. He's at whatever sin it is, it could be anything that men are enslaved to. Jesus is able to free them from it. He is able to deliver them. That's what he does. You must beg Christ for deliverance. You know what alcoholics or drunkards need to do? They need to repent. They need to turn to Jesus, and they need to beg him to save their soul and to change them and to make them new creatures. That's what they have to do. You can skip AA and you can skip all the other 12-step programs and all the other things. There's a one-step program, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. It's he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It is Jesus. He is the there are men that are looking for deliverance through promise keepers, which is nothing but a cult. They're looking for deliverance through AA. They're looking for deliverance through all these things to be delivered or to be, to be freed from sin in those chains. And the one answer is Jesus Christ and him crucified. He is the answer that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's why the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is a guaranteed promise. That shall be saved. 
That is God's promise that he is able to deliver us. He is able to secure them. Why? Because he went through all the temptations and everything, and he was wholly harmless and without sin, undefiled. He was separate from sinners. Again, the Bible says that no drunkard shall inherit eternal life. What a warning for people to have. God would not put this warning in here if Jesus made, out, made wine into fermented water, into fermented wine, and got people well drunk. This warning wouldn't be in here. These warnings here about the drunkards, right? Wouldn't even be in the Bible. But it's in there for your admonition, for you to understand, and for you and I to learn that Jesus is able to deliver us. Jesus is able to free men. He came to set the captives free. He's able to deliver men who were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There are men that that live their lives right now. There are men on this planet right now in this city, in this town, that they are enslaved to alcohol. They are enslaved to booze. They are enslaved to drugs. They are enslaved to fornication. They are enslaved to all manner of evil, pharmaceutical drugs. I don't care what it is, fentanyl or anything. I absolutely believe 100% by the authority of Scripture that Jesus Christ is able to deliver those men and save their souls. I believe he is the only answer. I believe he is the only answer for men's sins. He is the only, the only way that you can be made free is if you are made free. And that is Jesus Christ that makes men free. He makes them free. He delivers them from whatever bondage of sin that they are in, whatever has got their souls and has taken them. I have a gospel that I can preach to all men because I can proclaim to all men that Jesus Christ is able to deliver them. He is able to save them, that they are fallen creatures, that your problem is not alcohol, your problem is you're a sinner. And sinners do what sinners do. You know what the problem with the world is? The same problem it's always been. Sinners. They're pagans. Pagans do what pagans do. They are sinners. They are sinners before God, and the Bible says they are exceedingly sinful, and they are enslaved to their sin. And when a man tells me I can't put the bottle of alcohol down, I can't put the drugs down, I believe you. I know you can't. I couldn't either. Jesus has to save your soul and change you and make you a new creature, and then you will be delivered from it. Then he will give you the power over that sin to be delivered from that. It takes the power of Christ. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanseth men from their sins to deliver them from them. That's what it takes. It takes forgiveness of sins, and that's why Jesus came. See, sin has them. Alcohol has them. Drugs have them. Fornication, whatever it is, the works of the flesh, they are completely controlled by a sin nature that will eventually lead them straight to hell. It will destroy them and lead them straight to hell. They will die in the, with the bottle of liquor. They will die choking on their own vomit. They will die from their own sin, whatever venereal diseases, whatever shared diseases, whatever overdoses, whatever it is, they will die from those sins. And the only one that can deliver them from those sins is Jesus Christ. It is the gospel that saves men's souls. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. It's the only answer for the drunkard is the gospel. It is the only answer today. That's it. It's, it always has been. By the way, I reiterate this. No liquor drinkers are allowed at OPBC. We don't, you don't get to casually drink alcohol here and be a member of this church. There's no such thing as casual drunkards, right? We don't, you don't do this here, right? We don't do this. We don't live by this. We don't have uh, alcoholics come in and live here and, 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 uh, or run their, uh, be church members here. We might have some that may visit here and they may get saved and God may change their life. But alcoholics, drunkards, or any of those, they're, they're, not, they're not to be among you, the Bible says. They're not to be among you. And that should be, that total abstinence should be what people, what, what God's people live by. That should be what they live by. Again, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This is the deliverance that comes with the gospel. 
Oh, I don't say that you won't be tempted by alcohol or you won't be tempted by fornication. Or you won't be tempted by any of those things. You certainly may. You can be saved out of those sins, but you may still be tempted by those things. You and I are, are, uh, have a fallen nature still that is with us and we'll always have temptations towards things because we've opened doors that never should have been opened in our lives and they affect us for the rest of our lives. But God is able to deliver. God is able to keep you from falling. Christ is able to present you faultless before Christ, before him. Oh, this got messed up a little bit, but I want to close with these points here. Should Christians drink moderately? This is to sum it all up here. Even, no, the answer is no to all, right? But no, even slight drinking impairs one's thinking and lowers alertness to spiritual danger, which we've given the scriptures to be sober. Okay, 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Number two, no Christians, no, because Christians are not to be controlled by liquor, not to be controlled by alcohol. They're to be led by the Spirit. They're to be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Number three, no, because Christians are priests, and the Bible forbids priests to drink. We are priests unto our God, right? We're believer priests. That's who we are. Every single person in here that's saved by the grace of God, you are a believer priest, right? You've been made that by Jesus. That's why you, need, you don't need another man to interpret for you. You don't need another man to to interpret for you because you have the you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. That's your believer priest, right? You're to be that. Um, number four, no, because Christians are not to touch the unclean thing, and it's it's unclean, right? Number five, no, because Christians are to abstain from all every form of evil or all appearance of evil. And six, no, because Christians who drink cause others to stumble. You and I don't want to make anyone stumble. Jesus would never have done any of these things. And these 10 proofs, I believe, show that Jesus never would come close to serving alcoholic wine to anybody or fermented wine to anyone because he was holy. And he wants us to live holy. And he's commanded us to live holy. And he's equipped us to live holy. He's equipped us. None of these things should have a control over us. None of these things should be a part of our lives. And, and you children ought to remember that. A total absence from alcohol and you'll never fall for the tricks of the devil. In that right. There'll be other ones he'll throw at you, but you'll never fall for the tricks that accompany alcohol. The mockery that accompanies it. The trickery that comes with it. The deception. The, the humiliation that comes from it. And the sin that results in it. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you. For your words and for the truth, Lord, we thank you that you still save sinners. We thank you that you're still able to turn an old alcoholic and drunk into a child of the king, forgiven and all their sin wiped away. And Lord, that goes for any sin. We know that you're able to deliver us and to keep us from falling, to strengthen our hearts, help us to live for Jesus. I pray for the lost, Lord, that they would be saved, that they would come to the knowledge, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they'd repent and put their faith and trust in Christ. I pray for these young people that they'd never touch alcohol, they'd never touch uh, those things, drugs, and never touch those things that would harm them and, and lead them into a sinful life or even take their life, steal their testimony and their purity. Lord, help us to live good testimonies, to encourage our children to walk by faith and to never get into the world. May they understand how dirty, filthy, rotten, and wicked this world is, and that Christ is clean, holy, and just, and has the answer for their lives, and he will bless them with such a good life in him. Lord, bless the time we have together. Bless the prayer service this afternoon and the time we have with the children as well. Bless the food, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.